Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Vinu Sandhu. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. Fighting a losing battle, chief executives of Indian smartphone vendors like Intex, Micromax and Carbon had in 2017 accused Chinese smartphone makers of dumping low-cost devices into the country. This had made it tougher for them to survive. In their joint appeal to the government, they had asked for help and suggested that the government impose anti-dumping duty on Chinese phones. Two years before this appeal, in 2015, Intix was the second largest mobile phone vendor in India by volume. This year, its share is close to 0%. With a market share of just 0.5%, Micromax is in effect the last man standing. Our next report looks into how Chinese smartphones wiped out the Indian brands. We all remember the famous Micromax tagline, nothing like anything, and wondered what it meant. The company brought one smartphone after another a decade ago, capturing a healthy market share and becoming India's biggest mobile phone brand. Since then, it has been a downhill journey for not just Micromax but also other Indian mobile phone brands. The entry of Chinese companies decimated Indian brands like Micromax, Lava, Carbon and Intex. TechArc, which tracks the market share of Indian versus Chinese brands, has analyzed this impact. The share of Indian brands has now fallen from 68% in 2015 to a mere 1% in 2021 in terms of shipments, marking a complete reversal in the handset environment. In the same period, the Chinese brands' volume share rose from 32% to a staggering 99% in 2021. In terms of value too, the share of Indian brands has dropped to a mere 1.2% in January to October period of 2021 compared to 25.4% in the calendar year 2015. In the same period, the Chinese have established their domination, hitting a value share of 64.5%, up from 17.8%. Indian brands are, however, still commanding a decent presence in the feature phone space. Even there, ITEL, a Chinese brand, leads the feature phone market with some 27% market share, followed by Lava. And the rapid switch from feature phones to smartphones doesn't bode well for Indian firms. Indian players say Chinese smartphone makers were able to pull off this feat by discounting, which is reflected in their financials. Vivo made losses of 349 crore rupees in FY20, although its revenues went up by 45% to Rs 25,124 crore. Oppo also hit losses of Rs 2,203 crore in FY20 on revenues of Rs 38,757 crore. We spoke to Pavel Naya from Counterpoint Technology Market Research to understand why Indian brands could not keep pace with their Chinese peers. Um, if you talk about uh, you know the prevalence of Indian brand in 2014-15, they almost have close to one third of the market share. And uh, you know, in that point of time, these Chinese OEM they started entering the market. In 2016 uh, first quarter, they, they were able to capture almost half of the total market share. Uh, first of all, you know, most of these players uh, play to their strength when they enter the Indian market. They did not actually copy their old strategy. Um, so, for example, uh, players like Oppo, Vivo, Gioni, they, they had uh, quite a huge budget when they came to India. They started building a really strong offline presence. Xiaomi, Motorola, they came up with a very unique uh, channel strategy. In that point of time, it is unheard of. It's basically online only, it's Oppo, Vivo. They started experimenting with the new aspect ratio of the of their uh, new devices. Also, the emphasis on overall designing to make your make their device quite uh, slick, you know. And uh, people who have money and want to upgrade from their entry level to mid or uh, a, you know affordable premium segment, they um, did not have much options but to opt for this product. They were located closer to the ecosystem of smartphone manufacturing in China, and most of the Indian player used to rely on them um, or the contract uh, manufacturer based out of China, Chinese uh, ecosystem. 
in fact if you look at the kind of portfolio they had in the very initial stage they kept it very lean those product are almost like uh, you know 30 percent lesser cost than its competitive um, uh, you know similar specs and value product right if you if you talk about india as a market it's very price sensitive and people look for value for money so most of these Indian brand uh, used to rely on, though now they have started, uh, you know, do, uh, developing their R&D more recent uh, years, but uh, earlier, you know, they used to rely on the third party to design and develop and manufacture their product. Uh, so they lost their added, added advantage to, to those players who develop their in-house technologies. In the recent times, to expand their market share, Chinese companies have been executing an umbrella branding strategy. This allowed them to follow different approaches for different product lines. Due to new government policies, they have also localized their production. This has made India the second biggest mobile manufacturer after China. Nearly all the phones sold in India are manufactured here. A media report states that Apple and Samsung are set to locally manufacture smartphones worth around $5 billion in FY22 under the government's production-linked incentive scheme, exceeding the center's target by more than 50%. Although five domestic companies are availing themselves of the PLI scheme, they have committed only 10% of the total incremental production value of 11.75 lakh crore rupees under the five-year scheme. Lava and Micromax are plotting a comeback boosted by the PLI scheme. But given the dominance of Chinese brands and Samsung, your guess is as good as mine whether they succeed in their plans. Experts, meanwhile, argue that the main reason behind this is the failure of the country to invest in research and development, keep pace with technological change and build better products. After smartphones, let us move on to the World Economic Forum where both the leading economies had divergent views on some issues and almost similar ones on others. While Prime Minister Narendra Modi pitched India as a global destination for investment and told countries that it was the best time to invest here, Chinese Premier Xi Jinping asked the world to open the borders while condemning building exclusive yards and high borders. Let us have a look at the key points raised by both the leaders. Global diplomacy kicked off in the new year with the World Economic Forum's Davis Agenda 2022. This week, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi gave a special State of the World address at the Davis Agenda via video conferencing. Chinese President Xi Jinping also addressed the summit. Let's look at some of the key points raised by both leaders. On COVID, Modi highlighted India's achievement of having administered 160 crore doses, adding that a democracy such as India has given the world a bouquet of hope. Modi hailed India as the pharmacy of the world while also praising the digital infrastructure built by his government to deal with the pandemic, mentioning contact tracing app Aroge Setu and Covin. On the reforms front, Modi talked about his government's achievements in having deregulated several sectors like drones, space and geospatial mapping. India has carried out big reforms in the outdated telecom sector, the Indian PM added. Modi hailed India's entrepreneurial talent, mentioning that the country now has more than 60,000 registered startups and over 80 unicorns, of which 42 entered the club last year itself. He also pitched India as an investment destination for the world. Make in India, make for the world, is bhavna se aage bad rahe. Telecom, Insurance, defense, aerospace ke saath saath ab semiconductors ke kshetra mein bhi bharat mein asim sambhavna hai hai. Growth ka ye kalkhan green bhi hoga, clean bhi hoga, sustainable bhi hoga, reliable bhi hoga, global good ke liye. बड़े कमिटमेंट्स करने और उन पर खरा उतरने की परंपरा को जारी रखते हुए हमने 2070 तक नेट जीरो का टारगेट भी रखा है 
Meanwhile, Xi stressed more on the challenges that the world faces amid the pandemic. He spoke about ensuring the equitable distribution of vaccines among countries and said that China has already delivered 2 billion doses of vaccines to 120 countries and will further contribute 1 billion doses to African countries. On the challenge of ensuring economic recovery of the world economy, Xi said, The global industrial supply chains have been disrupted. Commodity prices continue to rise. Energy supply remains tight. These risks compound one another and heighten the uncertainty about economic recovery. If major economies slam on the brakes or take a U-turn in their monetary policies, there would be serious negative spillovers. They would present challenges to global economic and financial stability, and developing countries would bear the brunt of it. Amid heightened tensions between the US and China over Taiwan and amid fears of possible Russian intervention in Ukraine, Xi said, We need to discard Cold War mentality and seek peaceful coexistence and win-win outcomes. Our world today is far from being tranquil. Rhetorics that stoke hatred and prejudice abound. Acts of containment, suppression or confrontation arising thereof, do all harm not the least good to world peace and security. Hailing his country's economic growth, Xi talked about 8% growth in China's GDP in 2021 and the importance of bettering economic and trade ties with other countries through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or RCEP. Let us go to former Foreign Secretary Sham Saran for some insights. Looking at the speeches of uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, uh, President Xi Jinping at the World Economic Forum, uh, what I was struck by was the uh, similar emphasis uh, in uh, both their statements on the criticality of uh, multilateralism and multilateral approaches uh, to resolving some of the cross-cutting and global challenges that the world is facing. I mean, you particularly mentioned, for example, the pandemic, mentioned uh, climate change, and both mentioned, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, contributions that uh, each country has made uh, to the world in trying to uh, uh, to fight these challenges. Uh, the other uh, aspect perhaps uh, we should note is that Prime Minister Modi made a very strong pitch uh, for India as an investment destination, uh, as an economic and technological partner uh, for uh, other countries, uh, saying that the possibilities today in India are unmatched. And uh, he on, not only spoke about, uh, interestingly, about uh, make in India, but make for the world. This is a slogan goes back for some time. But also he uh, uh, spoke very much about the uh, India's openness to free trade agreements. Now, this is something which is very interesting. Uh, Xi Jinping, on the other hand, was much more concerned about, you know, the global economy being kept open, that there should be no barriers to uh, trade, to technological cooperation. There should not be any de decoupling. There should not be trade wars. So obviously, his uh, preoccupations are somewhat different uh, from India in this uh, respect. And that comes out very clearly. Clearly, both the leaders had different perspectives and standpoints, which meant that they stressed somewhat different themes. However, at the same time, there was some similarity in their approaches to the challenges of the day, particularly as far as the importance of multilateralism is concerned. Back home in India, Benchmark indices have fallen in two out of the last four trading sessions amid global headwinds. Both the US bond yields and oil prices are hitting their recent peaks, denting a rally in equities. However, technical setup for the Sensex and Nifty points to a pre-budget rally. What's our next report to know? Key levels on the indices and trading strategies ahead of the budget. With the union budget presentation just a fortnight away, equity investors have decided to sit on the fence. Yesterday, the BSC Sensex ended at 60,755, down 554 points, while the Nifty 50 shut shop at 18,113, down 195 points. With this, the frontline indices have fallen in two out of the last four trading sessions, slipping over half a percent during the period. 
Historically, markets have turned volatile ahead of the budget presentation, although the trend mostly has been on the upside. An analysis by Anand Rathi's shares and stockbrokers throws light on the same. The data since 2010 reveals that equity markets surged up to 5.6% in the month preceding the budget and 1.3% a week prior to the D-Day. On the downside, they fell a maximum of 7% a month prior to the presentation and about 4.2% a week before. This time too, equity class is turning volatile, but the upward bias remains intact. We have with us Business Standards Avdhud Bakkar for a quick chart check. The overall trend for both the indices is bullish as they have successfully conquered the resistance range. For Sensex, it was 60,800 and for Nifty, it was 18,100. This momentum signal a firm underneath strength and any healthy correction should see bullish buyers in coming days. This may see accumulation and addition in long position. The bigger picture highlights a rally towards a new all-time high for Sensex and Nifty. Sensex may touch 63,000 and Nifty may scale up to 18,900. Nifty Bank is currently trading sideways, but sustaining above 38,000 levels suggests a positive bias that could see 40,200 in coming future, which is a jump of nearly 5% from current levels. Given this, Narendra Solanki, Head Equity Research Fundamental at Anand Rati Shares and Stockbrokers, advises investors to focus on growth stocks. I think investors should focus on growth sectors and sectors where China Plus theme or import substitution theme could be played. Near-term investors should continue to add stocks wherever market provides any opportunity. Meanwhile, Ajit Mishra, who is VP Research at Religare Broking, suggests accumulating infra, agri and defence-related stocks on dips. The markets have made uh, remarkable progress in last one month and uh, now inching closer to the record highs uh, ahead of the budget. So, uh, but yes, we have mixed indication from the global markets uh, you know, at present and uh, we believe that the earnings and the budget expectations would dictate the trend from here on. So, in the run-up to the budget, uh, you know, several index majors uh, would announce their numbers. So, volatility is likely to remain on the higher side. So, we recommend maintaining, uh, you know, focus on the sectors and themes, uh, you know, and using the intermediate corrections to accumulate, uh, you know, quality stocks from the infra, affordable housing, defense and agri-related pack. As regards Wednesday, movement in bond yields and oil prices will be the key drivers of the market. Besides, Q3 results of 33 companies, including Bajaj Auto, Seat, JSW Energy, LTI and Tata Communications, along with the IPO of AGS Transact Technologies, will guide investor sentiment. The Indian economy and equity markets have both grown exponentially since liberalization in 1991. Reforms, still by then Finance Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, have catapulted the 30 share BSE Sensex from 1400 points in July 1991 to over 60,000 now. But in 1991, the country was in the midst of its worst balance of payments crisis. Our next report tells you more about balance of payments. Balance of Payments or BOP records all transactions, be they in goods, services or assets, for any country with the rest of the world. All such transactions over a specified period, usually a year, are tracked in this way. This is also known as the balance of international payments. Think of it in another way. BOP is a statement of all economic transactions that a nation's individuals, firms and the government enter into with individuals, firms and governments outside the nation in question. BOP allows one to monitor all international monetary transactions. The aim, in short, is to determine how much money is coming in or going out of the country's economy. Knowing the strengths and weaknesses of the economy is the basic purpose of BOP accounting. One can determine the overall gains and losses from international trade by analyzing the BOP accounts of the previous year. 
The current account and the capital account are the two main accounts in the BOP. Imports and exports in goods, trade in services and transfer payments are recorded in the current account. On the other hand, all international purchases and sales of assets such as money, stocks and bonds, etc. are recorded in the capital account. Foreign investments and loans are also included in the capital account. The country is said to be in balance of payments equilibrium when the sum of its current account and its non-reserve capital account equals zero, such that the current account balance is financed entirely by international lending. The balance of payments deficit or surplus is obtained after adding the current and capital account balances. The decrease in official reserves is called the overall BOP deficit and the increase in reserves is BOP surplus. A country with a current account deficit can face difficulties. In the event that the deficit is large and its economy is unable to obtain adequate foreign investment inflows, the country's currency reserves dwindle. And that's all we have for you today. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news and analysis. Stay tuned and thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.